Hello and welcome to the Nick Lugo Show. Today I had on Dr. Ann Prieto. She is a neuroscientist at Indiana University who studies things so important such as neuroplasticity. And that's exactly what we talked about today. It's really the study of learning and memory, how our brain is plastic and how we can change our brains to, well, improve our lives, impulse control, get rid of depression, you know, learning, memory, and well, pretty much anything you want. That's neuroplasticity you're changing your brain to improve your life and she talks about the basis behind it and well how we can change and get better so she was a really really sweet lady i just had her on she was absolutely wonderful and um well here it is i hope you enjoy yeah my husband has to teach this semester <laughs> he bought like a bunch of n90 95 masks oh um he, where does he teach yeah. Indiana? He teaches, yeah, he teaches uh, neural networks. Mm. Yeah. yeah I know what those are. Oh, wow. So you guys are just, you guys are just a neuropsychological couple. We're, we're both neuroscientists. Uh, we met in graduate school. Wow. We do very different types of science, but um, yeah, we're interested in, in the brain and the nervous system. Yeah. Wow. So did you guys ever have like a moment where like each of your like fields kind of like collapse on each other and like he gave you an idea or you gave him an idea? Well, you know, interestingly enough that you say that. So before we met, <laughs> we worked in the same thing. Crazily yeah. enough, like of all the topics you could possibly work on. Mm -hmm. When I was in Chile, I was studying biochemistry there and I used to work on an enzyme called um, acetylcholinesterase and it's an important enzyme because when you when you going when you going to contract muscle the way you contract your muscles is the nerves release a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine and so all of muscle contraction is based on that one neurotransmitter. Is that ACTH? ACH. ACH. Acetylcholine, yes. And so, um, and so I used to work on the enzyme that destroyed that neurotransmitter. Mm. And when he was a ger in Germany as an undergrad, he worked on the same enzyme. Mm. <laughs> and we published in the same fields, which was so weird. Oh. And then um, when we met, he had already started doing more computational work. Mm -hmm. um, and I stayed with like the cellular molecular approaches, so more biology, not so much computational. Yeah. So now we're very divergent in, in, in our approaches, our questions, etc. Well, I'm wondering, so did you grow up in Chile? Yeah. So since you grew up in Chile, how did you end up getting into well, exactly what you get into. I'm kind of wondering like what your story is, you know, how you kind of ended up getting into something as crazy as neuroplasticity. <laughs> so, you know, I, I often ask that myself. <laughs> like, um, so I still have my friends from high school that I were very close um, and I talk to them and I see their lives and I can, I see their lives, I understand their lives. I can kind of have a vision of what their life is like, mm -hmm. um, but they have like no concept of what my life is like, mm -hmm. just yeah. because it's just so, it's so um, specific. It's just such a specific thing, what I do. And so I like biology. So in Chile, when you graduate from high school, you have to pick a profession. It's not like in the US where you do four years of college. Yeah. No, you go directly into your professional school. And so I loved biology. I had a great, great biology teachers in school. And I really liked biology. I really liked history as well. So I was kind of split on to what to do. Um, but I finally thought, you know, I really like science. 
Um, and so I had to decide whether I was going to be a, a medical doctor because you have to make that decision when you're like 18. Yeah, so that thing. was a, a, a tough decision. But at the time I was young, you know, when you're young, you don't see the world in, in all its, in all its uh, you know, manifestations. You just see it from your limited experience and I thought that I was going to be too emotionally involved with my patients that maybe I wasn't strong enough to be a doctor mm -hmm. a medical doctor okay. which of course that's a young person's perspective because the medical professional trains you and you would could have options of women but that's what I thought at the time. And so I decided to study biology, which I really liked. And then uh, I studied biochemistry because it gave me like a really good basics of the chemistry, physics, math that I wouldn't have if I had just studied biology. So the biochemist had more an in-depth um, of those basic scientists, sciences, which I wouldn't have studied by myself <laughs> if I had to, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I went for the difficult thing. Um, and so that worked to my advantage. Um, I learned a whole bunch of things that the biology majors didn't, didn't get. And so in my fourth year, I had a pharmacology class and we studied the neurotransmitters and how neurotransmitters regulated behavior. And I really thought this is just fascinating. Mm. And so that's what, you know, I said, okay, this is what I wanna do. And so I, as, as a result, I had, to, I had to do a thesis. So we get something that's called a licenciature, which is more like a master's. It's a combination of a degree. Then you have to do that little thesis which is a year and a half of work, wow. you know? And so I did it in a lab and um, of, a, of a scientist that studied, you know, neurotransmitters and whatnot. And so, yeah, and after that I, I decided, yes, this is what I wanna do. And so I, my dad convinced me <laughs> to get a PhD in the US because in Chile at the time, the economy was horrible. There wasn't much future in research. There was absolutely zero money. People were like, you know, doing very basic things. Like this project that I had with this enzyme, you know, was just like a little shoestring project of an enzyme that I was, you know, studying, not very much going on. And because I spoke a little bit of English, he thought that maybe I could do it. And okay. so I took a chance and applied to lots of places, got rejected everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wrote more letters and I said, what if I go there, you meet me and you interview me? Um, and so that's how, what I did. And because I had this thesis, I had done this research, then, you know, I wasn't like a South American person who didn't know anything. Yeah. You know, I had some research experience. I don't think that if I, if I hadn't had that, I don't think I would have been accepted anywhere. Yeah. Of course, this is in the 80s, right? With no internet, yeah. you know. <laughs> no globalization whatsoever and so things have changed dramatically now but yeah it's so it's well i mean that makes sense right you go in there and most people don't do a master's research right they usually do their research as a phd and they have a thesis right yeah, yeah. so yeah. you kind of had you kind of had a leg up right i had a little advantage yes and then so what got you into right now you study neuroplasticity right and um you know, well, you know, that's the brain changing and how it, how it sort of morphs and, and grows and well degenerates. So yeah, how did you get into that? Yeah, so I, um, so do in my PhD, mm -hmm. I studied uh, neural development. Mm -hmm. 
mm. okay, which is kind of analogous, not, I'm not saying the same, but it's analogous to the way the brain changes, right? So in order to form, right, so a certain series of events take place uh, in order to get to a certain level, so to speak, of development. And then um, neuroplasticity kind of re rehashes some of those events that also occur during development. So, now, this ability of the brain to change, to have this plasticity, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of a newer concept because for longest period of time, it really wasn't, didn't, people didn't believe that the brain was capable of adapting very much. Now, we know that you can learn new things, but that was kind of held as a separate phenomenon, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of like the circuit changes, but without a structure underneath, you know? So okay. like sort of like this electrical thing that was going on, but the substrate itself where that occurred, people didn't believe that that it changed that much. Yeah, so like maybe literally changed. using a different route, right? Not that the route changed, but that maybe it took another road to get to the same place. Okay. And so, yeah. And so this is kind of a newer phenomenon. And so because I worked in some molecules um, that we call cell adhesion molecules that bind cells together, during development, you know, cells stick together, move together, some move apart, so you lose adhesion. Cells that migrate and leave, those who lose adhesion, but others stay together. Yeah. So we have cell adhesion molecules. And some of those same cell adhesion molecules are the ones that mediate the contacts between the cells in the brain, between the neurons, to form the connections where the cells talk to each other. And so um, I met my friend, uh, Carrie Lai, who also has a really interesting background. And he had isolated these 16 mu molecules, um, and, and a couple of them look like cell adhesion molecules. And I got really interested because where these molecules were found, they were found in this area of the brain called the hippocampus mm -hmm. that is essential for learning and memory. And because I had that background in cell adhesion, I thought that that was a fascinating a link between molecules that are localized in this important brain region, but at the same time that could um, mediate interactions between cells in a physical in a physical way. Yeah. And so yeah, so that's how I started getting interested in learning a memory and molecular changes that un underlie this, these ch uh, changes with experience that you're calling neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense. Like one of the things that I find so interesting about neuroplasticity is like, we know that it happens, right? Like we know that if you meditate for a long time, then you're going to have more activity in your prefrontal cortex and, you know, like the thinking part of your brain and impulse control. If you, the famous London cab driver study, if you drive more often and you study the map of London, then you're going to be able to have better spatial abilities and understanding of maps, you know, and your brain physically changes. Like we know all that. But one of the things that we don't know is we don't know how it happens, you know, like, and I think that's one of the things that you're really getting at. It's like, well, part of it has to do with the hippocampus. Part of it has to do with, you know, just the brain changing and all these molecules. But at the at, at, at a deeper level, we don't completely understand it. So I would love for you to kind of take me through, you know, like the story 
of neuroplasticity, you know, like the story of, okay, you start off with a human who doesn't have um, much development. He goes through a learning trial and then his brain changes. So the first question I, I must ask is what are sort of the preconditions for neuroplasticity? So you kind of, you know, what kind of external things must happen? What kind of internal things must happen for the brain to begin to change? Right. So we, 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 you can uh, recognize, like you very well said it, so you're, you're right on, right? Some extrinsic things and intrinsic things. Yeah. So intrinsic things would be things that the, the, the cells, right, that the tissue itself has to have some properties, have to ha be there in order for to allow for those changes to occur. Mm -hmm. So not all areas of the brain have this ability, okay? So some areas have, have more intrinsic ability to sustain these changes, mm -hmm. other regions, not so much, right? And you want that because you don't want all areas to be constantly changing yeah, that right, in response to the environment because we're embedded in an environment that is constantly changing, right? So you cannot have both things changing, right? And having, having to constantly adapt. There has to be some constants. So for example, right, we breathe, right? And so, you need to breathe. So the system is set so that we breathe at a certain rate and there's some neurons here in the back of our head that regulate that rhythm, right? So those are not going to adapt, right? You don't want those guys to be adapting, right? Um, under any circumstance, you want that to remain steady. Um, and so, so this ability to change, right, is not the same in every region of the brain. Like you say, you know, like there's regions like the, maybe the frontal cortex or the hippocampus that have more of that ability and, are, and have been identified to have more of an ability to adapt to changes in the environment what we call experience, right? Um, and so uh, how does this, so how does the tissue change with experience? So the main, the main thing that happens is there's changes in how much information, uh, how much, um, how, how much a region is subjected to changes in information. Right, and so if you have uh, regions that are very responsive because of their intrinsic properties to respond to these big changes in activity or experience. And so uh, you need that. And how do they do that? So that's, that's some of the things that I study, for example, so you need, um, those points of contact to either you, you can make them to function better, more efficiently, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or you can do that and increase the number, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So you can move the buckets of water faster mm -hmm. or more buckets, you know, so, so changes like that. Um, or you can also put more hands moving the bucket, so more, more receptors that can sense the more information. And so you can make adaptations in the system that make the system more efficient mm. or less efficient, right? Yeah. Um, if you're not using an area very much, you might want to eliminate that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, you see this with 
uh, amputee. So like if you were to lose your hand, right? The part of the, of the brain that receives information from that hand is not receiving very much information because those fingers are gone, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so then the other hand, the neurons that process information from the other hand kind of take over the territory. Uh, so that's an example of losing and then winning, right? Yeah. Sort of like a Darwinian competition for yeah. territory. Well, that probably explains why blind people hear better, right? Like that sort of right. thing. Right. So also, yeah. And, 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 and also there's an attention issue as well. So it's not just the sensory perception, but the, um, your ability to pay attention to certain things more, um, uh, more acutely, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's one of the things that they found in Buddhist monks, like that really kind of blew me away, you know, like those people who really meditate all the time, really have taken the time to quiet their mind, their brain actually shows it looks different than the rest of the population, right? Like yes. you, you can make a, probably a weak claim that, you know, that their brain was like that before they started meditating, but it's, it's pretty, you know, it makes a lot of sense that the meditating probably did a good job at increasing their neural connections and well, making them better at focusing, paying attention and controlling their impulses. Like I find that something to be incredibly interesting. Yeah. There's also this, all this, really interesting uh, field of um of in uh, of trying to understand how some people have more of a sense for their bodies so things that we normally say they're autonomic right they're automated and they're controlled from the neck down by the autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. right like breathing blood pressure heartbeat you know, body temperature, right? Maybe if we have a fever, but we're not thinking, oh, I am 2.3 degrees colder. My body's 0.3, you know, we're not, we're not going around like that. Um, or I cannot say, hey, you know, I think my, my heart is beating three beats per minute less. I mean, I don't know, but some people can. And these Buddhist monks can, you know, change their body temperature and they can regulate their heartbeat, really? right? Um, pretty in, in ways that, you know, a, a normal person can't. Yeah. And so there's this whole field of trying to understand on this, how we have full integration right in an unconscious way but people can access those unconscious what we would assume are automated or unconscious functions and but in a conscious manner right oh, yeah um, and so that's a really interesting um area of study so a lot of people who study consciousness um like this guy, Anil Seth, that I really like. Uh, so he's big in, in, in what is the, the seed of consciousness? What is consciousness? And he has this idea that there's this integration with the body and that, you know, it's fully, it's a fully integrated, right? So that, that this idea that we just, it's in the central is is just uh, not not hundred percent correct. That's so. So I really like that idea of integration. Well, that's a very like you know that's that's one of the Buddhist philosophies. Like that's a very spiritual idea. You know, the ability for you know you to completely control every single part of your body. And you know, people don't really understand like the power of the mind. Like this was something that really kind of blew me away. There was this um phenomenon that happened a while ago have you ever heard of multiple personality disorder dissociative yeah. identity disorder right so there was this lady who she was struggling with multiple personality disorder who was labeled that at the time and she goes to a hospital and one of her personalities is her you know sort of like conscious like in the way that we are you know sort of runs the show um 
was saying, I don't have diabetes right now, but if I transition to, I don't know, let's call her Alyssa, you know, if I, tra- if I go to Alyssa, then she's actually going to have diabetes right now. And <laughs> they say, you're lying. Like, what are you even talking about? And then the doctor said, then she goes, okay, test me. Right. And they tested her for insulin levels and all that stuff. And they found that she didn't have diabetes. And then she transitioned to Alyssa and they tested her again and she had diabetes. Right. Yeah. They're trying, they're trying to exploit that for medical purposes, because for example, um, opioid dependency. Mm -hmm. Well, so there's this whole concept of placebo, right? You're aware you, you know, placebo, it's kind of the same idea. So if you take a person and you uh, do the whole thing, you take them to the hospital, you sit them in the hospital bed, you give them an injection of nothing, of water, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, but if the person is, is you know, the more, the more, the, the, the closer it is to the real experience, the mm-hmm. more effective the placebo effect it is. For opioids, for them to- For anything. Hmm. for anything and so they're trying to do this for opioid uh, people so they're giving them like taking their opioid with a mint Mm -hmm. right yeah they learn to associate the opioid with the mint right and then eventually they wean them off the opioid but the mint stays and so over time the body learns to associate the mint with the opioid and then the body itself learns to associate that, that, that taste and smell of the mint is accompanied by this reduced pain, right? Oh. But you're not taking the medication. So the body itself takes over that task of oh, reducing wow. the pain. It's kind of a placebo, right? But learned in a way. So it's like um, they have this mint and this mint is in their brain, something like- Right, the, heroin, right? The, right, the decreased uh, pain is associated with the mint. Wow. And so then the body is not receiving the opioid anymore, but we have endogenous opioids, right? Mm-hmm. So the body itself, starts mimicking that uh, response right, by its own means. Wow. So it's a way to exploit this placebo effect for a therapeutic purpose. Um, but we know very little you know, about how we're controlling the body, like that lady that you're saying about the insulin and, and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, we know very little about this internal control of these organs. And we have a whole entire nervous system, (laughs) the pathways, neurotransmitters, the whole thing is mapped. We know a lot about it. Yeah. We take lots of drugs that we know (laughs) function very well in the periphery um, as opposed to central. It's a little bit more complicated. And so there's a lot to learn there. Yeah. Well, it's very easy to see, you know, like it's, it's something that you could try with yourself and we do every single day. You know, I think of something right now, right. And I could make myself stressed just by the thoughts, right. Nothing crazy, nothing like there wasn't a lion that just started to attack me. I just came up with a thought in my mind. And not only does that affect my, my brain, but that also makes my, I think it's my kidney start creating cortisol, which makes me stress and influences my entire system. And I think that's one of the most important things about, you know, like the Buddhist monks and all of the, all of those meditators, one of the things that they're so incredible at, and you kind of hinted at this before, is also being able to control their emotional states. So, right. yeah. So, I mean, you get into a specific emotional state and, you know, maybe a Buddhist feels some sort of negative emotion, right? For the average person, if they feel that negative emotion, it takes over them, they start feeling rage, aggression, anger, whatever, they start becoming resentful. The Buddhist monk, he has so much control over his body, he has so much control over every single aspect of his, you know, personality that he could just say, nope, I don't want to deal with it. And that emotion just sort of dies at the, dies at the source. 
Yeah, so, uh, so you know, I, again, um, all of these things, um, unfortunately, you mm -hmm. know, we live in a society that, um, that where the individual, right, gets a little bit lost. Because, for example, if you take any medication, like um, if you take any medication that you're going to test in large groups <laughs> in order to quote unquote approve it and make sure that it doesn't have a lot of side effects, right? Mm -hmm. Or to identify what are those side effects or identify in what subset of individuals those side effects actually occur. It might be then in another subset, they don't, right? And so you test lots of individuals. And so at the end of it all, right? We are practicing medicine based on big groups of people. So the individual sort of gets lost. Yeah. And so when it comes to mental health, uh, personal behavior, again, we, we tend to think of big populations and not in individualized what are the individual's experiences? You know, how can we best uh, try to address something that may not be working for that person, um, et cetera, et cetera. Medications is a mess uh, because um, drugs that work on the central nervous system are notoriously, you know, <laughs> uh, effective in a small subset of individuals. And when they do these big group things, you know, they get tossed out in the clinical trials. So very few drugs that work on the central nervous system get approved mm -hmm. because there's so much individual variability uh, in terms of behavior and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, that's one of the interesting things that you kind of like worry about you know like humans right in general we are so good at receiving anecdotal stories right like, <laughs> like you know like somebody tells a story i was i was literally learning today about this guy named mark metry mark metry was a guy who at 16 years old was just completely like antisocial, like started gaining weight, like, you know, like was a very big like video game type kid played a lot of minecraft things like that and the only problem with, you know, like excessive, like many, many hours a day on video games. And he never really developed his social skills. And by the time that he was about 22, he turned into someone who had a podcast, 350 episodes, you know, <laughs> wrote a book on how amazing he is now at socialization, speaking to people and putting himself out there and all of these things. And, you know, humans are very receptive to that. We're like, well, I don't care about the multitude of people who fail. I say, okay, there's Mark Metry who succeeded, who probably changed his brain in a tremendous way, you know? And we say, well, I want to be like him. So uh, yeah, you're right. I think it's something like really interesting to see. Like there's the, the people who exceed the average and science wants to focus more on the average. Right. <laughs> Yes, because, yeah, because, because um, that's uh, what, uh, what ultimately, right, um, if you want to sell <laughs> something, <laughs> right, um, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to sell it to a large number of people. Yeah. And also, it's not just a selling point, but you want to ensure that it's not damaging, right? A large number of people either, that it's benefiting the most people, right? right. Because you could you could say, well, this drug, I'm 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 coming up with this drug, and this drug only works on let's say two percent of people with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And that is fine, as long as you can say what 2%, right? right. Because you're not going to get a psychiatrist giving a drug to, you know, every patient with schizophrenia, if only you know that drug works on 2%, yeah. right? Um, maybe if the person is desperate enough, or you've tried all other things and nothing has worked, maybe you'd be willing to do it. 
Um, and so you don't want to harm, right? And so, so you also need need to do all this testing and as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, so I have, I have an interesting, well, I guess question, right? This is really a lot along with what you're saying. You know, I wanted to see kind of what your take on um, psychedelic substances, which are now, <laughs> well, I mean, now they're incredibly popular, but definitely very controversial. You know, they, um, they're known for increasing neuroplasticity. They're known for de- you know, being able to, in clinical trials, decrease addiction, depression, OCD, all of these things. I wanted to see sort of what your take is, especially given how incredibly good they are at neuroplasticity, but then at the same time, they're also very, they have a high potential to be harmful in the way that, in the way that you said, you know, that might be a problem. So how do you sort of feel about them? Do you feel like they're hopeful, harmful? Okay, so, you know, it's like everything you have to characterize it, right? Mm-hmm. So there's many things that are, that are beneficial, right? Mm-hmm. So you could, you could take lots of drugs that are very beneficial, but it depends how you take them, when you take them, right? And who takes them, mm-hmm. right? Um, so for example, I'm just, I'm just gonna give you an example, simple, antidepressants. Mm -hmm. Uh, some drugs that we know exactly what they do. They bind to a transporter on the presynaptic cell and only to that transporter and nothing else. And if you take them for three weeks in let's say 40% of uh, severely depressed individuals, they feel better. Okay. (laughs) We know every little detail about what this thing does. Now, we have no idea how, in spite of knowing all the little molecular details of what this thing does in the body, how those 40% individuals, how their their depression is alleviated, Mm. okay? So there's like a big gap in knowledge there. Same thing with these psychedelics, right? You might know where the little molecule from the mushroom binds and does this and does that that we can do really well Mm -hmm. we can do that really well but how does it go from having a horrible hallucination right to improving your symptoms of 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 anxiety for example right how that, where that fine line is and why individual X got the horrible hallucination and the other patient uh, had, has beautiful uh, increased uh, learning and memory, we yeah. don't know. Hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm gonna ask you, Nick, are you gonna take that, that uh, psychedelic? Well, I mean, I don't, well, so I know there's a big thing on, um, it really needs, you really need to do it on set and setting, you know? So John Hopkins, they did a giant study. Well, there was giant. A, oh, okay. Define giant. So over a thousand people. Okay. That's not giant. Really? No. That's not giant. Well, yeah. So they, they have over a thousand people. Right. And, um, and they found if you give them in the right environments, then there's going to be, you know, um, then, then they had zero bad trip experiences, zero bad hallucination experiences, all of them labeled, it's like a few people labeled their experiences as slightly negative, but no negative long-term effects. And, you know, I think, I think I definitely would love to wait until they are legal, like that would make life a lot easier, or if I could do it in an experimental setting. Right. So I, I'm not, I'm not saying no. Right, but I'm just saying that these things are um, tricky because, like I said before, we're there's so much, there's so many di- individual differences that when it comes to things that act on the central nervous system, the responses can be very, very different. So, antidepressants in adolescents. They 
have increased suicidal rates that mm. you don't see in a 50 year old, but yeah. you do see it in adolescents, right? So clearly there's differences there. And so I don't know, you know, the Hopkins study was in a medical setting, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Those people were, you take the big, uh, the big uh, magnifying glass, right? They were very monitored very well. The drug that they gave them came, was highly purified, mm. right? It didn't come from a mushroom here or whatever there, right? It was synthesized in the lab, right? To the microgram, right? Yeah. And so in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a setting like that. Now that is perfectly acceptable, right? I'm fine with that. As long as then, um, then, like you say, there's no negative, uh, too many negative side effects. But um, a thousand people, it's not a big study. For a pharmacology type. As far as a central nervous system acting drug is. Okay. It's not a big study. Yeah, I mean. I... It's promising, right? Mm -hmm. it's considered promising i mean i'm not i'm 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 trying to be um i'm trying to be uh i'm not trying to be negative i'm just trying to be cautious yeah um yeah well, that's what it seems so i mean that's one of the i guess worries with these psychedelic drugs right so right now it's considered a potential by the fda a potential breakthrough therapy i was talking to joseph right. Hart this uh i had him on my podcast a while ago and you know this is this is kind of what are you saying he's like you know there are many people who do it in the wrong set and setting there are many people who don't do it in the right experimental conditions and there are many very strong potential harms that could happen if this makes it makes it way its way out of the lab you know but then at the same time it, it's very promising for the future so right yeah, I mean, I'm I'm all for it. You know, I'm all for it. Like, um, for example, this drug ketamine that's yeah. been around forever. Mm -hmm. Ketamine has been around for a really long time. It's been used for, as an anesthetic, and it turns out it has this really powerful um, antidepressant effects, like mm -hmm. almost as good as you know this horrible thing they do to people which is called electroconvulsive therapy yeah. that is only used in, you know, the most extreme cases of untreatable depression with, uh, with clear suicidal thoughts that resistant to any other treatments, they, they, they do the electroconvulsive therapy. Mm. It's all, I mean, it's fabulous because the person wakes up and the depression is gone. Mm, yeah. And that's also true with the electroconvulsive therapy. Everything else we have may take weeks or whatever. Ketamine does that too. Again, mm -hmm. in a clinical setting, <laughs> the person goes, is in the in the bed, they inject the cat, you know? Yeah. And so in a controlled environment. Yeah. Makes sense. So all right, I want to ask you a different question. Um, I was wondering, you know, there is, there's a lot of dogma that comes around in terms of just neuroplasticity measures. So one of the things that I was wondering about is whether or not you could say whether or not this dogma is correct or whether or not it is kind of true, false, has a little pretense to it. So one of the ones that I saw was, and this is one of them that's kind of been in my head for a few years now, you know, it's sort of just a dogma that's been passed down. Your brain changes every single day. Is that true or is it not? Uh, yes. <laughs> true. Okay. Yes. I mean, uh, parts of your brain, right? So like, you know, every single day. So, so the brain is not static. The, so the brain itself is not as an a static organ. It's the total opposite. It's a highly dynamic organ. Mm -hmm. um, now, activity in the brain changes from millisecond to millisecond, right? Yeah. And so it just depends on what you are defining as change. Okay, right? yeah. You see what I mean? So 
yeah, we change. We, we go to sleep and we wake up. So those are two completely different states, mm -hmm. right? So, well, so was, that's there, right? Yeah. Now, if you're talking in physical terms. Yeah, like synaptic connections, right. neurogenesis. Right, right. In, in, if you're talking to in synaptic in synaptic terms, right, from a from a cellular perspective, right, um, I would say yes. There's there's changes. Like for example, if you take um, we we can see this. You you can do experiments in animals, so you can you can take a rat, mm -hmm. open the cranium, put a little glass window in it, right. And image it, put a microscope and image the same neuron over time. Okay. Right? Which we couldn't do until recently. So yeah. we're not talking about activity, you know, neurotransmitters being released, but just physically tracking what that cell looks like today, three hours from now, a day, you know, you can't do it for very long, <laughs> but you can do it for like a day or two. And you can see changes, physical changes in that cell and those synapses and those connections. How long? So cells are dynamic, they change, they adapt. Yeah, so does that happen over, when you say you see changes, how long? Hours hours really right but okay so i'm going to tell you something else so mm -hmm. so when when we're talking about these things right the scale at which they happen also matters right so if you have right if you have a lawn <laughs> lots of grass and you kill and you and you take one little blade of grass here and one little blade of grass there mm -hmm. and you look at it would you be able to tell that there's that you took two blades of grass out no no right so the same thing in the brain so how much you change also matters so you you can make changes that don't do anything that are just at the noise level yeah. right and then there's changes that are more meaningful and so in some areas of the brain small changes will have a big impact in other areas you need really big changes to have even a small impact so so i would say that overall yes um now the, then you also need thresholds for change. <laughs> uh, so for example, the use it or lose it uh, idea. So like if you're a guitar player, right? And you're using your fingers a lot, your cortex is highly adapted for you to using your fingers a lot. So that's a typical example of neuroplasticity. You use it more, then this is more active. And if you stop using it, it becomes less active. But there's a window of time, right? It's not all or nothing. It's not going to change between when you were playing the guitar mm -hmm. and then the next hour that you, you went out with your friends, right? Uh, it's going to take a period of time where, oh, I'm not getting activity. I'm not getting activity. I'm not getting activity. I'm trying to adapt to keep that in place. And then at some point, because you're you're there's a battle between maintaining and losing right mm -hmm. the losing starts winning because those changes that maintain that that steady state of oh high level of activity i'm i'm gonna stay like this um are not there anymore so there's this tug of war and then one starts winning over the other Makes sense. Yeah. That's one of the things that I really wonder in people who are like addicted to things, right? You know, and in things like addiction, you have these proven, really sad stories of people who, you know, become very addicted to something and then they start losing the dopamine receptors in their brains because, you know, imagine you have a thousand dopamine receptors and this is just a random number, a thousand dopamine receptors and like 800 levels, um, we'll say neurotransmitters of dopamine. It, 
the 800 attaches to 1000 and you know you have a little extra receptors but that's kind of how that's not really a problem but then you take something like an amphetamine or you take cocaine or you you know just do something that releases a crazy high level of dopamine then you have 2000 dopamine uh neurotransmitters that are binding and then your brain says whoa we shouldn't have this many dopamine receptors so um, we shouldn't have this much dopamine activity so it decreases it brings that 1000 dopamine receptors down to like 600 and then well the dopamine makes you feel good and it gives you focus and it gives you attention and all of these things and then eventually what happens is you wean off the addiction you stop being addicted you go into remission and you realize that life isn't as bright and colorful and wonderful as it used to be and the things that used to make you happy don't make you as happy anymore because you don't have the dopamine that gives you the focus and the energy and the motivation to really do things you know so i really wonder how you know how flexible the the dopamine receptors and you know the changes happen you know and how long it really takes for someone who's addicted to get their dopamine receptors back if at all right so you know so those are questions that they have clear answers. So, uh, of course, in animals, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so it, it, might, it might be a little bit differently in humans. And in humans, you can do these studies also because you can use um, labeled dopamine molecules and mm -hmm. see how long they stay bound to the receptor. You can do all of that in humans as well. But of course, the overwhelming majority of the studies are done in rats, in rats. and mice. <laughs> um, and so for, for you're going to have short-term adaptive changes and long-term adaptive changes. So the short-term adaptive changes are, okay, more dopamine, right? I'm going to downregulate my receptors, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then that may be, you know, uh, a week, right? But then if you stop taking the dopamine, right, then the receptors come back. <laughs> so that's kind of a short-term regulation and no harm done and you can do that for a while you can do that one month two months three months mm. right depends how much dopamine how much drug you're taking yeah. um, but then over a period of months right mm. the system goes whoa I cannot keep up I cannot keep adding these receptors plus you've changed your gene expression you've mm. changed the the how your genes are regulated and maybe you've shut down the synthesis of those new dopamine receptors that you you had to make to put them on the membrane yeah maybe you can't do that anymore maybe the system cannot do that anymore so after a few months right then the system doesn't adapt that well so then you have the short-term changes and then the long-term changes. Mm. Then, and then the, the, the problem is when you damage the pathway. Okay. The system is not designed to have that level of high activity, right? Over a period of years, right? Or several years, several months, whatever you did, right? Mm -hmm. And so at that point, the neurons die because in order to synthesize uh, dopamine and all these neurotransmitters that you need, you need molecules that are damaging. They, they are oxidants. And in order to keep up with all this receptors, et cetera, you produce molecules that end up killing the cells when you have excessive activity when you have a single pathway that is over activated over and over and over by these drugs of abuse and so over time yeah you can adapt for a little while short term long term you have another set of adaptations and then long term you're going to end up this, uh, eliminating cells that then you lose that ability to adapt and respond Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's like, you know, it's funny yeah. what you're talking about is learning 101, right? Like <laughs> yeah. your brain is learning. Okay. 
I really can't handle all this dopamine. Is it purposely killing the cells or does it just happen to kill the cells? Byproduct. You know, neurons. <laughs> uh, so neurons uh, are amongst the long lived cells in your body, right? If you think about your skeleton, you think that, oh, that's pretty permanent. Uh -uh. Like on a 80 year old, you've turned over all the cells in your skeleton about 10 times in your lifetime. Wow. Your neurons in the brain, you're born with them. Yeah. And you have them until you die. That's yeah. it. So the only thing that happens is you can just lose neurons. That's it. So in your adulthood, you have this tug of war, which is keep it or die. That's it. <laughs> so either you preserve that neuron or otherwise it dies. And the nervous system has all these mechanisms in place to keep these cells alive. Mm -hmm. prevent them from dying because you cannot generate new ones yeah. and so um and so neurons are pretty easy to kill by the way really uh, you have to permanently keep them keep them alive and synthesis of neurotransmitters has a lot of byproducts that actually end up killing neurons um just oxidative metabolism um among them so yeah so i was reading this study the other day and i want i want to see what you think about it so it was a study in which they had an older people right and they said okay this group should um do crossword puzzles, Sudoku puzzles, all that stuff, you know, like really worry about your cognitive decline and all these things so that if you keep your brain active, then you're not going to have this use it or lose it phenomenon, right? And then they had another group who didn't do any of these activities, who just kind of like didn't do any brain stimulating um, things to keep their brain active. And they found that there was cognitive decline at almost the same rate for both of the groups. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because, believe it or not, it's impossible not to use your brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like doing a puzzle doesn't change very much. You know, it might change activation of a certain specific area. Mm -hmm. But overall, your brain is active all the time. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, no. The, these little things of, oh, yeah, well, I'm using my brain because I'm, I'm doing a math problem or I'm using my brain because I'm playing chess or I'm using my brain because I'm playing this video game that I have to pay all this attention. Yeah, certain areas of the brain are more active, but overall, right, um, you know, if you're awake and alert, and you're receiving sensory information, right? And you're processing things and you're thinking about things, your brain is active. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that was one of you the- You know what I mean? Yeah. What they have said though, is cognitively, if you wanna stay, if you, you wanna, if you wanna improve your cognition a little bit in the older individuals, not in the younger individuals, in the older individuals, is exercise is more effective than these little cognitive tasks. Yeah, um, aerobic exercise, right? So exercise is actually better to prevent cognitive decline than these, you know, um, little cognitive exercises that you can do. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I mean- it physical, makes physical exercise. Yeah, exercise. yeah. I was actually reading that they said it was aerobic exercise. So like, you know, weightlifting doesn't count, but like going for a jog, going for a run, cycling, all that stuff is very walking, cool. fast walking. Yeah, something like that. Okay, I did want to do a pivot, though. Um, I have two more questions for you. So one, I wanted to figure out what, um, what neuroplasticity and memory have you know, like, what is the, the combination? And really, how does memory work in the brain? Because that's sort of been my, uh, I how does it work? Yeah, okay, I mean, so, <laughs> so we know a lot, <laughs> actually. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so we know a lot. Um, thanks to Eric Kandel. Um, he's uh, worked on a sea slug <laughs> of all things. But they, they started 
trying to figure out could we could we study learning and memory at a synaptic level at the points of contacts between two cells and this was pretty controversial because the old school psychology said that no learning and memory occurred at a systems level this had to do with activity but not so much with like the nitty gritty physical components of the cells in the brain and Eric Kandel essentially said, you know, demonstrated that no, that we could change physically the structure of the cells and the molecules in the cells, in the neurons, and that was directly linked to learning a memory. Mm. And so a lot of the research nowadays is focused on what are those changes what are the important changes because neurons change right with neural activity but what are the 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 things that matter in terms of changes and then <laughs> the million dollar question is where are the memories stored yeah. and what that that storage uh, actually translates into physically in the brain, okay? okay? And this is so interesting because now we have all these techniques mm -hmm. uh, that scientists are using to study this question, using um, a new technique called optogenetics, where you can activate neurons, um, you yourself can activate them by shining light on them and making them fire. And so you can identify neurons that fired during an experience. And then you can reproduce that experience just by shining a light on these cells. The animal thinks that it's experiencing, let's say, being in a room with dots again, when no, the animal is just having the neurons stimulating by a light and it thinks it's in that environment again, wow. right? So now we can recreate, we can recreate experiences and elicit memories, right? Using these techniques. And so people are actually trying to study. So are uh, what cells are, uh, uh, participate in the in eliciting this memory, right? Uh, how much do you have to stimulate them? Do they get stimulated by only one stimulus, by one experience, or by multiple experiences? Yeah. And so these are things that we're actually learning wow. um, and studying now. So, so really fascinating. So in the well, to your point, so is the brain actually changing? Like, so I know um, you have a memory, right? Let's yeah. say part locus four and five of your brain light up, right? So what's actually happening inside of your brain? I'm sure, I'm sure it has to do with something called long-term potentiation. Right? Yeah, so, so that's just a fancy, it's just a fancy term mm -hmm. for changes in um, electrical activity of the cell, that um, the electrical state of the cell changes when it gets stimulated like crazy, okay? So when it has a really large stimulus, that cell changes in a way that it becomes uh, more stimulated by a little stimulus. So for example, if I give you $1, right? And you could buy one Hershey bar. Mm -hmm. And now with that same dollar, you can go and buy 10 Hershey bars. So that dollar, right? That's that, uh, that purchasing capacity mm -hmm. became uh, much higher. Yes. So that's the same thing that happens to this cell that got stimulated because of, uh, of this, this big stimulus that was so salient and so important for the animal that it's worthy of storage, right, of 
of knowing because it's going to come in handy the next time I have this experience. And so those things are molecular changes. Molecules change. You insert more receptors on the membrane. So now uh, when you when you when you have 10 molecules of glutamate before you had two receptors so the response was equal to because it didn't matter if you had a million or 10 you only could sense with two but yeah. now if you put a hundred receptors now you can sense a hundred uh, molecules of glutamate or dopamine or whatever. So mm. now for the same stimulus, you have a much bigger response. Mm. Um, and so the cell changes the molecules that are, that are being made, DNA expression changes. So we can identify neurons that have been recently activated just by using molecular markers. Uh, this molecule called FOS, you know, if you stimulate a neuron, it gets made uh, very quickly. So you can identify neurons that have been recently activated, for example. So when you guys define memory, right? So you say like the memory of, let's say, you know, are you talking about the memory? Like if I'm talking about my memory of when I was in sixth grade and yes. this happened, or are we talking yes. about, it sounds like kind of, well, correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like what you're talking about is like, 50 receptors binding to 50 glutamates glutamate neurotransmitters that is memory because it um because before it was 40 and now you're raising it up to 50 and that that sort of constitutes right. you made you made that connection more efficient yeah right and because you made that connection more efficient right then you made a change that altered every single event that happens after that right so that's kind of your initial initial event mm -hmm. right um and that occurs when you when you make two connections so for example mm -hmm. you grab a rose you see that it's red so you have the visual information from the visual system but you also smell it mm -hmm. and it smells really nice now, those two events, seeing that it's red and the nice smell arrive together mm -hmm. in one cell that now makes that connection. So that stimulus is much bigger because it is equal to mm -hmm. odor and visual color, right? Than if it was just visual or if it was just odor. So in your mind, you've put those two events together Right. So you've learned now that the rose is red and it also smells good. It doesn't smell like lavender, right? Mm -hmm. It smells like a rose. And so now that, uh, because those two events occurred simultaneously, right? Yeah. That makes that, uh, that cell where those two things arrived at the same time more efficient. So then that sets a series of cascade of events that makes the connections between all the cells that participated in, in, in that scene stronger. Got it. So, so for example, another, another example, let's say you went to a party <laughs> and you met a redhead and there was a guy really annoying that was smoking and there was... Um, this other guy that you've seen before with a blonde beard and they were playing this great song, I don't know, whatever, you know, Madonna. Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, a few days later, you're in the, you're waiting for your bus and you see the cute redhead again, okay? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have this vision of the party right? You remember the guy with the beard and the song and the, the sm smoking, you see the whole scene, but really you only saw one element, okay? And yeah. that element is enough to elicit the entire scene. So the idea is that we have all of these events that took place at the same time. So all the neurons that participated in processing 
all that information, visual, olfactory, um, uh, auditory, all of those cells form connections, right? That were very efficiently made because they all got activated at the same time. And that forms a bond uh, between all of them. And so then when you activate one, because they were all connected and all occurred at the same time, now you can elicit the whole activity of this whole network at the same time. That's so that's more or less what we're thinking happens in the brain when you, when you learn something, but also you recall it after, right? Yeah. Learning and recalling are separate things yeah well that's one of the things that kind of blew me away like so you're talking about neural networks right neural networks are right because it's not just one little part of the brain that participates in learning and memory memory storage is disseminated mm. it's not one area of the brain it's yeah distributed well, that's one of the things that kind of blew me away. Like I, I, I spent a lot of my time reading, right? I decided a while ago I was going to really start reading. And then I realized that I didn't remember what I read. And I was like, oh, you know, what's wrong with that? What's kind of the reason why? And then sometimes I would just be randomly thinking like whatever, like wandering, daydreaming, things like that. And I would get a, a flashback to something I read in a specific book. And I was like, on what world, like why exactly is this specific fact from this specific book just suddenly coming to mind if I couldn't recall it in the first place? And what it seems like is what you're saying is they were sort of placed together, like because the ideas were right. put together. Right, that there was an element there, right, that was shared. Um, you might not be able to identify that element, right? But clearly there was an element there right? Yeah. That was shared. It, it, it doesn't have to be obvious, something obvious, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this is how we make connections, um, things that we don't even know, right? Yeah. That we cannot even, uh, we cannot even uh, uh, identify. Well, that's one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard. I think it was, um, it was Steve Jobs who said, he goes, every single idea that I've ever come up with wasn't a new idea. It was just taking one idea and another idea and putting them together and combining them. And every, he said, every entrepreneur always feels a little bit of guilt because he feels like he stole his idea. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. when it's, reality, it's just he was yeah. putting two ideas together and that's exactly how humans create new yeah. ideas. You know, uh, People, I laugh because, you know, that's kind of a way of saying it. Other people, maybe new agey people say, oh, I had this intuition, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And no, you're probably making a, a connection that you didn't even remember or know that was there. We just have these words for things, right? Intuition. Well, I had this intuition and it turned out to be correct, <laughs> right? But that's just a way of making connections um, of things that we don't maybe not be very aware um, that we do. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that really... I started implementing in my life and it made such a big difference. Like whenever I wanted to, you know, whenever I was faced with the decision in my life, whatever the decision was, you know, should I raise my hand in class? Should I, you know, should I go to Chili's or should I go to Applebee's? Like these random questions. I used to always just be like, oh, someone else pick, someone else pick. It doesn't really matter, whatever. It doesn't really make a difference, you know? But I realized that the act of making a decision right? The act of saying, all right, I'm going to choose Chili's and I'm going to choose Applebee's and I'm going to whatever, right? I'm going to raise my hand in class. And I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to, instead of asking a question, I'm going to assume an answer and then see whether or not it's a yes or a no. What ends up happening is my brain then institutes some sort of feedback mechanism. So let's say I choose Chili's and it, it was a bad experience. Then I'm going to have in my head, okay, Chili's was a bad experience. I'm going to choose Applebee's next time. But if I just kind of say, okay, I'm just going to let someone else choose, then I never really develop that memory. I never really develop, I never really learn anything. Yeah, but also, you know, you have um, 
Also, you have to learn to listen to yourself, right? Because if you're always deferring to somebody else, you're not really self-exploring, mm -hmm. right? What is what is what is meaningful to you, right? You're not really get to know yourself very well, yeah. right? Because you're always deferring to somebody else. So then you're less self-aware. Yeah, and then you're worse at making decisions. And you know, then... you're 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 maybe less confident, etc., because you're not really listening to yourself. Mm. Uh, that's it's so at interesting deeper, at a deeper level. Yeah. 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 No, that's so interesting. All right, and then final question, and this is something that I feel is very practical. You know, what practices or supplements do you implement in your life to be able to increase your you know positive neuroplasticity? Do you? <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I, I actually take something. I actually take complex B complex. What is it called? Uh, vitamin vitamin B, but the entire B complex. It's a C series of different vitamins that all fall into the B complex category. And why do you take it? Because um, it turns out that um, they're the basis for synthesis of neurotransmitters in the brain. Mm -hmm. And they're also, so they're used uh, uh, for the synthesis of neurotransmitters mm -hmm. and also for the synthesis of myelin, which is the support glial cells that wrap around the axons. They, uh, they need that vitamin B. And it's kind of hard to get vitamin B because you get it from uh, meat and dairy. Mm -hmm. And um, and also as you get older, like I'm getting older, um, you absorb less and less and less mm. vitamin B over time. And uh, the last time the doctor measured it and I had I was normal, but on the lower end of normal. And I thought, gee, this is not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm a professor, I'm a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I should take better care of my nutrition. Well, what uh, it seems so... like is, it seems like it's a bit of an amplifier, right? Like it allows for, for the good or the bad, it allows for neuroplasticity to occur. Yes, okay. and, so, and so it's definitely something that I take. Um, and, you know, sadly enough, uh, we have a lot of uh, examples that this is useful. Um, you know, nowadays, uh, adolescents take nitrous oxide to get, um, to get high, you know, to get euphoria. Mm -hmm. and, um, and nitrous oxide interferes with vitamin B complex. And there's mm -hmm. been many, many reported cases of paralysis. A neurological damage uh, because this uh, nitrous oxide depletes uh, vitamin B in the body. So, so that's a very concrete example of how important the vitamin B complex is in neural health. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. really interesting. So if you're a vegetarian uh, or you're any, anybody in your audience is a vegetarian mm -hmm. and they should uh, make sure that they're, they're getting a good uh, source of vitamin B. Vitamin B complex. Awesome. Yeah. And then what practices do you do? So do you, are you a meditator? Do you do a lot of cardio? Do you? <laughs> yeah, I do my aerobics. A very important, it synthesizes brain derived neurotrophic factor. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this has been found um, to support uh, uh, the birth of the only neurons that we make in the adult brain in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And so we need our little BDNF on the little running wheel in the rats that you mm -hmm. can measure this. Um, so I, I run a little bit, I exercise a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I do yoga, <laughs> mm -hmm. which it's a little bit meditative. Yeah, it's very mindful, right? There are also a few other ones that I was interested in. Intermittent fasting is supposed to increase neuroplasticity, healthy sleep, limiting stress. And yes, very important. All of those things. So all of those things. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I found was stress actually degenerates the brain. Yes, it, cortisol kills the neurons in the hippocampus. But uh, what... um, actually, uh, people with post traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. um, they've done autopsies on them, and some of them have uh, only a third of their hippocampus left. Wow. Wow. Yes. And that's, and they... that's the learning center. So people. Yes, absolutely. Learning... Yeah. yeah. And they also, yeah, I found with PTSD people, they also have increased um, depression, in increased suicide. Yeah. Yeah. And they also have oh, something, their amygdala, their amygdala was a lot. Their amygdala, yeah. 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 Super yeah. interesting. And um, so one thing I was wondering is when you sleep, right? So you go to sleep, right? There are, there are chemicals that make you fall asleep. The thing that makes you wake up right? The thing that makes you wake up is cortisol, right? The same cortisol that is stress, the same cortisol that, you know, that makes you lose two thirds of your hippocampus. So what is the reason behind that? Like, how should someone wake up in the morning, first of all, right? Like, should they be completely stressed out? How could they increase their cortisol levels? And then also, why is cortisol, like, what are healthy levels of cortisol? Because clearly there needs to be some level of cortisol for you to wake up in the morning. Right. So, okay. So, so the waking up, <laughs> so the waking up may or may not have to do with the cortisol. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So, okay. so yes, it plays a role, but your neurotransmitter cycle uh, in your sleep cycle and, and, and sleep is, is, is a mess, right? <laughs> because sleep has different stages. Yeah. Okay. And the stages shorten and expand as your, as your sleep progresses through the night, yeah. okay? And then cortisol can influence all of those things. So it, it's a complicated effect, yeah. right? right. Um, and so it's not necessarily that, you know, cortisol may, may shift things around, but it, cortisol will not wake you up or not wake you up. Okay. Um, so it may modulate. Also cortisol, changes with the circadian uh, cycle of the day. Mm. So levels of cortisol are higher in the day and lower in the afternoon. And so, you know, these are, these are fluctuations that prepare the body to function. So cortisol is very beneficial, right? When you don't, you don't have like staggering levels uh, because it promotes uh, storage of energy, it mm. promotes the immune system. So it does all these really good things. It's just when it's in this chronic yeah. elevated levels, acute elevated levels of cortisol don't do very much. Okay. So yeah, the constant anxiety, stress from a PTSD. See, it's, it's the constant chronic elevation of it that is, is really uh, detrimental. Now, sleep and, and learning is very important because you have... Uh, reconsolidate, you have all those changes in the neurons that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of that occurs during your sleep. <laughs> so another good reason to sleep, to improve your memory. <laughs> yeah, that was what I heard, actually. There was a neuroscientist, his name was Andrew Huberman at Stanford. And what he said was, you know, a big driver of neuroplasticity is norepinephrine, dopamine. You have these sort of combination that allows you to focus. But what really solidifies the... Um, the neuroplasticity is it all occurs during sleep if you don't yeah. sleep your brain doesn't yeah. change have good friends of mine uh giulio tononi and um uh, if you ever want to interview somebody who's fascinating uh he's at uh, madison wisconsin giulio tononi and and chiara cirelli they're they've done i mean seminal work on sleep what are and their names huh? uh, what are their names how do you spell them uh, Giulio Tononi, G I U L I O, Giulio mm -hmm. Tononi, T O N O N I. Okay, got it. Yeah, now this. And <laughs> Giulio, he, he's done a lot on sleep. And also, if you want to talk to somebody who knows a lot about um, consciousness. 
Mm. Uh, he works on consciousness. Yeah. Interesting, Interesting guy. Really. Scientific study of consciousness. Imagine that. <laughs> all right awesome no this was this was really great like having you on i i learned so much like i i very very much enjoyed this so thank you so much i really no thank you for uh thank you so much for having me (laughs) 